than those three guys. We got the three-headed monster out here. They were just relentless. With that personnel, they would get you down and they would just flat you. It's not supposed to be yes, this it is. easy yes. for an offense to score like this. Within that crew, they had sort of all the elements that you're looking for. Check me out. I look good. Receivers are known to proclaim their greatness. Well, y'all don't know. I just look like this. I'm the man, man. Big game, man. I got big game. And as much as we love a good T.O. soundbite. I love me for me. On this list, we're more interested in how these guys function as a group. Every great quarterback needs great receivers. One, two, three. T.S.O.E. So what makes a great receiving core? You got to be almost perfect. Perfection is nice, but you'll need more than two receivers to make the cut. We got too much firepower. And no one-year wonders here. Longevity is a must. Jerry Rice is the touchdown scorer of the century. Hall of Fame and Super Bowl credentials will be considered as well. A lot of y'all ain't got that out there. All of them. So who's at the top of our list? Let the debate begin. How could there be three better receivers than those three guys? Here are our top ten receiving cores of all time. The number ten receiving core of all time. The modern day Colts. The great thing about Peyton Manning and the Colts offense is that they can hurt you in a variety of ways. The Colts are our number 10 receiving core due in large part to their incredible 2004 season. That year was extraordinary. Three receivers over 1,000 yards, three receivers over 10 touchdowns, and it could have been a lot worse. There were two or three games where they simply called off the dogs in the fourth quarter. Hey, protection stays in. He throws the stone big touchdown! That's the One hundred and three receptions, fourteen hundred yards, and twelve touchdowns. That's not Marvin Harrison's best year. That's what he averaged over eight seasons. Top ten, I think, without question, the numbers are going to say higher than that. I think people who underestimate Marvin just because of who he's been with aren't giving him his just due. What a hell of a catch by Marvin there! He's my number one receiver ahead of Jerry Rice all time. But you're talking about Marvin Harrison, certainly as as one of the great receivers ever. You know where the Colts are going to go with the football. They're going to throw it to Marvin Harrison. But sometimes you just can't stop it. It's another day in the office, baby. Touchdown, Reggie Wayne! Touchdown, Reggie Wayne! Touchdown, Reggie! And the crowd chanting Reggie. Reggie Wayne would be the number one receiver on most NFL teams. Touchdown, Reggie Wayne! That was a thing of beauty. A lot of people thought it was always Marvin was one and Reggie was 1A, and there was a lot to that until this past year when Marvin goes out with a knee injury, and, and Reggie's the guy. But what does he do? He has his best season of his career. With all due respect to Marvin Harrison, right now, Reggie Wayne is the go-to guy. What a catch at the 35, one-handed by wow. footballer Reggie Wayne. But the Colts wouldn't be our number 10 core without one heck of a supporting cast. If a defense takes Marvin Harrison out of the game, you've got Reggie Wayne. If they concentrate on the outside guys, you've got Dallas Clark or Joseph Adai out of the backfield. Peyton Manning, I'm thinking his lucky stars that he's had the great receivers to grow with. Unbelievable, the juggernaut that's been turned loose. I know Peyton Manning is pretty happy. All those guys are featured number one receivers on just about any other team in the league, yet they all work together and you know, ultimately won a championship. When we return, a receiving trio that rocked the NFL record books. It's nearly impossible to slow down a team like that. We got too much firepower.
Some Super Bowl runners-up finished just out of the running on our countdown. Andre Reed, James Lofton, and Don Beebe got the K-Gun to four Super Bowls, but couldn't make our list. What a way to end a tremendous season. Steve Breston, Anquan Bolden, and Larry Fitzgerald each had 1,000 yards in 2008 as the Cardinals won the NFC. Larry Fitzgerald stabs the ball out of the air. Good day to throw. In 2007, Randy Moss set a single-season record for receiving touchdowns, and Wes Welker caught 112 balls. Touchdown, Patriots! Championship football! But you don't have to reach the big one to crack our top ten. The Patriots will not be perfect. It was another Moss-led group that made our list. The number nine receiving core of all time. The Vikings of the late 90s. We got the three-headed monster out here. 86, 80, 84. Deep downfield, it is to Carter. One-handed oh, catch. That was a one-handed catch. Mm. What a magical receiver that guy is. Chris Carter, Randy Moss, and Jake Reed. You had three threats that could hurt you on any different level. Deep, short, intermediate, inside, outside. What a great catch by Randy Moss. Touchdown, Jake Reed. Chris Carter. After being released by the Eagles in 1990 for substance abuse, Carter was signed off the waiver wire for the modest price of $100. He got him for a Benjamin. It ranks right up there with the Louisiana Purchase. Chris Carter, it is caught! Carter! Touchdown, Vikings! Greatest catch I've ever seen! The guy never dropped passes. I remember playing in a Pro Bowl with him and him making catches in practice that was like, are you kidding me? Like, this guy really is one of the greatest receivers of all time, in my opinion. Chris Carter! receiver in the league. Probably the best hundred dollars the Vikings ever spent. Make the play. Yes, sir. Make the play won't nobody else make. That's what makes it different. Deep down field. Touchdown, Vikings! They call me the freak, man. Oh, pepper keeps in the end zone. Caught. Super freak. Touchdown! Randy was a big play threat on any given down. Lobs right side end zone. Caught. Look at them boys over there doing all their practicing for the D-ball. Y'all ain't gonna stop it. They throw the ball up there as far as they could, and he come down with it. And Randy Moss just goes up and just makes it effortless. Throw it up above his head. They can't jump with me. Golly. The memory I always have is Thanksgiving Day at Dallas, Texas Stadium, the Vikings blowing the Cowboys out. Fires to the sideline, caught by Moss, makes a tackle, 45-40, pouring it on, 20. Oh, another touchdown, touchdown, Vikings. Randy Moss caught three passes, all touchdowns, all over 50 yards. What we playing today, you ain't got to worry about us. No, don't you worry about us. It was playground football at its finest. Touchdown, Vikings, Randy Moss. I think two of them uh, will be in the Hall of Fame. And I think Jake Reed, people don't remember how valuable he was. You gotta love this game, huh? You gotta love it. He had an era of about three or four seasons where he was incredibly productive. Deep to Reed. best of their era, our number nine receiving core got some help from their backfield. When you're trying to defend Randy Moss, Chris Carter, and Jake Reed, I don't know who you have left to try and slow down Robert Smith. The guy was a phenomenal open field runner. Eighty, what you gonna do today? I got my A game. You got your A game? A game! He got his A game. Deep to Chris Carter, and it's called touchdown! You got a little speed. I had to go get that one, yeah. It's nearly impossible to slow down a team like that. We got too much firepower. The 98 Vikings rang up 556 points, second only to the 07 Patriots. And their video game offense never scored less than 24 points in a single game. That was one of the greatest catches Randy Moss has ever made. The number eight receiving core of all time, the Pops. Individually, Ricky Sanders, Gary Clark, and Art Monk. Collectively, the posse. You had three perfectly complementary receivers, so you were pretty much picking your poison. Anybody could have that great day, depending on how the defense was playing. Grabs it, touchdown, Washington Redskins. 
The Colts might have done it most recently, but the Posse was the first trio of wide receivers to each eclipse a thousand yards receiving in the same season. Monk is wide open for a touchdown! Art Monk was such a danger. If you were a defense, you, you had to double Monk. And that left Sanders and Clark one-on-one. -on -one. Fires it into the end zone, touchdown! Wide open at the five, touchdown! All of a sudden you go, uh-oh, we're gonna take care of Sanders and Clark, and there goes Monk. Throwing it down the middle of the month. To me, what's really amazing when you have three receivers like that is that you're able to keep them all relatively happy. Touchdown! Redskins always did a pretty good job of that. What an incredible catch by Gary Clark! Got a man! Art diving Monk. catch! Touchdown! Art Monk dropping a pass was like something you document. I, I don't I, Three passes he ever dropped, I remember. He was an absolute clutch player. Despite ranking sixth all-time in career receptions, the Posse's ringleader was passed over for the Hall of Fame six times. That all changed in 2008. Uh, I don't want to single anybody out, anybody out, but Art Monk got in. That's pretty neat. I know it's been a long wait for him. Got him on the run. It's Clark. Horse race. Gary Clark burned out treadmills at Redskin Park. When he decided he wanted to play football, his dad said, okay, you're going to have to be able to run. So he would put him out on a country road in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and follow him in a car. And if he slowed down, he'd get run over. And he's going to throw another fly pattern. There he is. Touchdown. Monk was like the muscle car that was great at key possessions. Clark was sort of like the small little sports car that could go in and out, nooks and crannies. He had deep threat as well, but Sanders was just pure speed. Speed is great. He would run by you as he did the Broncos in that Super Bowl. Got Sanders on the fly, midfield, he's gone, touchdown, Washington Redskins. Sanders set Super Bowl records with 193 receiving yards and two touchdowns. Sanders in the clear at the 10. After the Super Bowl, we had an opportunity to go to the White House and present President Ronald Reagan with a, a football and a jersey. They came in and said, Rick, you're going to go ahead and last. The president going to yell your name and you come out and catch the ball. I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> he got to the mic and he said, where's Ricky Sanders? Where's Ricky Sanders? Where's Ricky Sanders? Four years later, our number eight receiving core would win their second Super Bowl, this time besting Buffalo's K-Gun offense. Going deep, he's got Clark, touchdown, Washington Redskins. Up next, one of the NFL's greatest receiving duos. Those two guys, they were unstoppable. Many great receiving duos were one star short of making our list. Touchdown, Brett Perriman, Herman Moore, what a grab! But the omission of one pair in particular caused quite a stir. No, no, John, Stallworth and Lynn Swan. What's wrong with you guys? Oh, that's a bad move by somebody. Let's face it, fantasy leagues have permeated our minds to the point of making us all stupid. All we do is look at numbers, so I can see why they're excluded, but I saw those guys play. I know how good they were. They were extremely good. Stallworth, Swan, and who is their tight end? Huh? Grossman? Give me a break. The guy couldn't even run down and field seven yards. Thanks, Phil. But one prolific duo did come in at number seven. The number seven receiving core of all time. The Marx Brothers. You could take Mark Clayton or Mark Duper and hold their numbers up, and they're twice the career numbers of Lynn Swan. I wonder, with another quarterback, would the Marx Brothers, would we ever remember them? I doubt it. Were they really stars, or were they just products of Dan Marino? You know, it's easy to say, hey, it was Marino and Marino in his prime. They were unstoppable. Caught for a touchdown. Holy Toledo, what a grab. Now, they probably couldn't have done the things that they did without Dan Marino. And Dan probably couldn't have done the things that he did without the two Marx Brothers. Dan, five, touchdown. 
Touchdown, Dolphin. I'm glad you said I've been enjoying this. And you got a guy like a Mark Clayton that I don't care how small the hole is, he's going to find a way to get in there and sit down, catch the football, and then break tackles and get into the end zone. Mark Clayton was just a great athlete. He was a small receiver, but he became a big receiver in the secondary by his ability to jump and go up and get the high throws. Both feet in bounds and held on to the football, showing what a great receiver he has turned into. You got a guy like Mark Duper, you just throw it for as you can, he go get it. I'll tell you, when Duper gets in behind anybody, it's Katie by the door. He runs the 40 and 425. You know, he was a track man playing football. He was pretty small of stature, small on stocky. Didn't, didn't really look like a, a, a wide receiver, but boy, he could burn it down that line. But a duo does not a receiving core make. To rank number seven on our list, the Dolphins had to have another weapon. He looks, lost to the corner of the end zone, Nat Moore, touchdown! To me, Nat Moore is the greatest receiver that's ever played for the Dolphins. People talk about Paul Warfield and they talk about the Marks brothers, and those are great players. But to me, Nat Moore was the most well-rounded receiver the Dolphins have ever had. Moore got in behind safety, and then the old man outran him. He had it all. He understood the game physically gifted, tough as hell, one of the most ferocious competitors I've ever known. 33 yard pass play to Nat Moore. What this receiving core lacks in Hall of Fame and Super Bowl credentials, it makes up for with its record-breaking 1984 season. That was a, a year of fireworks in Miami. Here's Marina, wide open field, throws for a touchdown and there's the record. That's quite an arsenal that Marino had to work with, and it's no wonder that he set records that would be stratospheric. That's 18 touchdown reception in a season he is the all-time record holder. As you start to look at the guys that were probably ranked ahead of us, I can guarantee you on any day, any time they want to lace it up and let's go at it, we would be the class of that game. The number six receiving core of all time. The 70s Raiders. Well, I think six on the list is, uh, you know, I don't know who. It must have been somebody back here on the East Coast, some young kid who really didn't understand football. I don't even want to know who one through five is. That is totally wrong. I'll tell you, the Raider trio of Branch and Casper and Politnikoff were, were fantastic. Politnikoff caught everything. Kenny could throw the ball anywhere, on the ground, in the air, in the end zone. He could tip it. He could catch it with one hand. Long pass. Hey, leap in the end zone. The lefty cop makes the catch. The pass is caught by Casper. Touchdown, Raiders. He was a big man that had the hands of a violinist. Yasha Heifetz never played a violin with more dexterity. He was just very smooth, very fluid but also very physical. Casper had a way of getting open, and he would not be afraid to take a hit or deliver a hit. You got a tight end who's got arms. His mother must have been a gorilla or something. They, his arms are like an extra foot long. His hands are huge. He's got Casper. Touchdown, Raiders! I think I like to be perceived as anything but a football player, and I don't know why. In terms of his personality, he gave you the feeling that he was not bored with the game, but he was bemused by the game. If you're going to be a great football player, you're going to be a little weird. Going deep to Branch, one-on-one -on -one with Riley, a leaping catch, touchdown Raiders! Every time you, you think about Cliff Branch, did he ever go short? No, he was always going for 80 yards. Throwing the bomb to Branch, makes a great catch, five yards lane, touchdown Raiders! Branch committed highway robbery without a gun! Not just a fast guy, but a fast guy who absolutely knew how to play the ball brilliantly. Branch against Livers. Branch catches it! Touchdown Raiders! Of those three, Cliff Branch to me might have been the best guy. And I remember talking to some of the Chargers and they said of that group, Branch was the guy who scared them the most. And yet Cliff Branch is in the Hall of Fame. I'm not sure why. With all this talent, why is the Raiders receiving core only number six? Maybe a sticky orange goo is to blame for their slide down the list. Was it cheating? Ah, there was no rules against it. Every team in the league had that stuff. 
I just put on a little just to make it tacky enough, you know, just to see what it would be like. You know, it was amazing. Olympicon, touchdown Raiders! And I always carry it on my socks so I can dab my fingers in it all the time. The worst thing was that he always had gum. Now his fingers are all filled up with stickum, so there's no way he's going to open up the gum. And he couldn't put it in himself. Now when he put all that glue on him. <laughs> Fred didn't need it. That was the interesting thing. I mean, he had the best hands of anybody I've ever seen play the game. If he could get a fingertip on it, he'd find the rest of the way to get his hand on it. In Super Bowl XI, the controversial pass catcher set up three Raiders touchdowns and was named the game's MVP. There are not three better receivers than those three guys. Think about it. You got a tight end, could catch anything, and didn't care about getting hit. Best tight end to ever play the game. You got Freddie Belinikoff out there. Absolutely the best possession wide receiver. And then you got Cliff Branch over there, and there's not anybody in the league that can run with the guy. How could there be three better receivers than those three guys? I'll take the Raider receiver, number one, hands down. Coming up. I don't think he liked blacks. I don't think he liked Catholics. I don't even think he liked his own family. Find out which receiving core broke down racial barriers. Close of the end zone. Touchdown! We're counting down the top 10 receiving cores of all time. Let's recap the list so far. Number 10. The Colts light up Peyton's place. Here's it! He got oh, it! What a circus catch! Number 9. The Vikings fearsome threesome. We got your three-headed monster out here. Number 8. The Redskins prolific posse. Within that crew, they had sort of all the elements that you're looking for. Number 7. Mark and Mark take Miami. They were two of the most prolific receivers in the league. Number six, the Raiders spark plenty of controversy. There are not three better receivers than those three guys. And now, the number five receiving core of all time, the 60s Redskins. I think our passing attack is very explosive because we have receivers who are very, very fast. That Redskins offense is easily one of the most explosive in NFL history. It was an offense that seemed at times unstoppable. They were really rewriting the record book. The Redskins' most impressive entry in the NFL record books came in 1967 when they finished first, second, and fourth in receptions. Five years earlier, Redskins owner G.P. Marshall traded for Cleveland Browns running back Bobby Mitchell. Whoa! I'm going to the Washington Redskins, of all places. Washington was the NFL's only all-white team until the federal government forced Marshall to integrate. I don't think he liked blacks. I don't think he liked Catholics. I don't even think he liked his own family. His friends will tell you that he, he really wasn't a racist, that he just was somebody who didn't like to be told what to do. I'm standing out on the field, and Bill McPeak, the head coach, comes out. He said, what do you think about going outside as a receiver? I said, okay. <laughs> The move paid off, and the pioneer member of our number five receiving corps was later elected to the Hall of Fame. Charlie Taylor was Rookie of the Year as a running back, but that didn't stop his head coach from cooking up a new recipe for success. Charlie Taylor could not harness his speed at halfback, so at midseason, Otto Graham switched him to end, where Charlie had room to roam. I can only think of three people who made that transition pretty well as many more myself and Charlie Taylor. Charlie was a tremendous competitor. He never felt that the guy on the other side was better. The guy was just so tough. Defenders would bounce off of him. Here's a guy that came into the league as a running back and when he retired he was the number one receiver in the history of football. In 1984, Taylor became the second member of our number five receiving corps to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. I think what makes it really special is the tight end. You know, Jerry Smith caught a lot of touchdown passes for that team. He held the record for touchdown catches for a tight end for a long time. Smith's record of 60 touchdown receptions stood for 26 years. Touchdown, Jerry Smith! While his numbers weren't Hall of Fame consideration, rumors of his homosexuality might be what has kept him out. I don't want to say for certain that it was his personal life, but that's really the only logical conclusion. To not even be a preliminary nominee for the Hall of Fame doesn't do him justice at all.
I believe football should be fun, fun for me as the coach, and also fun for the players, and fun for the fans. It was fun for everyone but the New York Giants on a day the sky rained football. At the center of that storm was our number five receiving core. The Redskins' 72 to 41 win remains the highest scoring game in NFL history. The number four receiving core of all time. The 49ers of the 80s. Number four. The 49ers of the late 80s couldn't carry a tune, but they sure could catch a pass. Oh, John Taylor, what a touchdown reception! It was an embarrassment of riches in a, in a variety of ways, too. One guy was a third down guy, one guy was a touchdown guy. Touchdown, Jerry Wright. One guy could break one when you least expect it. Taylor will go! Touchdown for the 49ers! So it was a spectacular array of talent. It was pretty amazing, the clockwork of that offense, and and you just knew that somebody was going to be open. Is there. Is there. Oh, the so the all go and just concentrate on this part of it or this part of it. But was the success of our number four receiving core due entirely to Bill Walsh's West Coast offense? The system was really the key for that passing game. If the receivers weren't open, you could look into the backfield and maybe throw it to Roger Craig, or you could have a tight end like Brent Jones. While the system was crucial, no group executed it better than the 49ers. The thing that you have to give that group credit for was they were taking this newfound offense and now showing the world how to play offense. What a catch he made on that for the touchdown. Well, I think Jerry Rice is the greatest receiver of the modern era. Jerry's numbers during the regular season are remarkable. He's got it! Jerry Rice is the touchdown scorer of the century. But he was just as good, if not better, in the postseason. Looking for the end zone, throws the pass, Jerry Rice! Touchdown 49ers! The boy is going to party tonight. I think you could say unequivocally that Jerry Rice was the greatest wide receiver that ever played the game. Uh, he's amazing. He's just doing things that no one else in this league is doing. Jerry Rice was surrounded by greatness. Tom Rathman and Roger Craig, a running back. Lobs it to Craig. Touchdown, 49ers. Roger Craig, of course, being the first guy in NFL history to receive and rush for 1,000 yards in the same season. Roger Craig is a rare find among NFL running backs, a man possessing sprinter speed, fullback power, and receiver's hands. John Taylor on the other side. For the end zone, leaping catch. Oh, John Taylor, what a touchdown reception. Now you had the Montana to Rice, but boy, there's always Taylor there. You know, he, he was one of those kind of days where, hey, we got Rice bottled up, but wouldn't you know it, John Taylor goes for 18 catches for 240-something yards. It's a Super Bowls are a mark of greatness, and that's why the 49ers are our number four core. Back to back, baby. <laughs> Super Bowl's the credential. Super Bowl is the credential everyone's measured by. Steps up, throws. I don't know that I can recall an offense being that powerful and that unstoppable. If you're going to rank the receiving cores of all time, you might as well put at number one the one that has the greatest receiver who ever lived. So yeah, Niners number one. Coming up, the receiving core that revolutionized the NFL. That was an offense that was way ahead of its time. Reggie Tom Pierce gathers it in on the dead run. Arena Football Friday. We shall pay any price, bear any burden. Overshadowed by the coronation of Camelot, pro football experienced its own revolution in the swinging 60s. Pass the end, Touchdown! It's the hammer, Mike Sitka! Prolific receiving cores in both the NFL and newly formed AFL shattered records and featured several future Hall of Famers. 
The Philadelphia Eagles had a one-dimensional offense, but that didn't stop Tommy McDonald and Pete Retzlaff from winning an NFL title. Everybody they played knew the only thing they could do was throw the ball. And yet they went out every week and they were still able to win because these receivers were that good. Led by Billy Grohman and Charlie Hennigan, the Houston Oilers scored over 100 touchdowns in the AFL's first three years. But it was the Los Angeles Rams a decade earlier who pioneered the vertical passing game. The number three receiving core of all time, the 50s Rams. The Rams really threw the ball around the field in the early 50s. And Mr. Elroy, crazy leg, Kirk, is touchdown bound. Norm Van Brocken drops back, throws an arching pass upfield. Reggie Tom Fields gathers it in on the dead run. If you had some you know, good, quick receivers, well, you're going to be very, very difficult to defend. And the Rams had three excellent ones. I mean, they had Elroy Hirsch. He was almost impossible to tackle. You had a guy like Tom Fears, who caught all the intermediate stuff. And then, and then you had Bob Boyd, who was uh, an NCAA... 100-yard dash champion. But Bob Boyd gets both hands on it and races to complete a 61-yard touchdown play. Our number three receiving core benefited from Coach Clark Shaughnessy's innovative three-end offense. That was an offense that was way, way ahead of its time. They brought into the game the spread of wide receivers. In fact, they would even take a tight end, spread him out, and, and in some instances had as many as five wide receivers in, in formation. That was really revolutionary. It was a formation that, that you'd see from time to time in the NFL, but only in desperate circumstances. But with the uh, Rams, it was a uh, staple of their offense. Norman Van Brocklin to Tom Fears. Sears the Lions secondary, and the ball's on the Detroit 14. Waterfield tosses an empty IO to Crazy Legs Hirsch. In Crazy Legs, the Rams had one of the all-time nicknames to go with one of the all-time receiving cores. I wobble back and forth, and the legs go kind of like an egg beater. If you've ever seen a girl run from behind, I run kind of like a girl. I always appreciate it because anything's better than Elroy. But nobody was better than Hirsch, whose numbers were dazzling. He had... 17 touchdown catches in a 12-game season. The average gain on those 17 touchdowns was 48 yards. Quarterbacks used to say he had eyes in the back of his head. He could outstretch his arms and pull a ball in over his shoulder, seemingly without even looking behind him. Crazy like Kirk is in the clear, and it's touchdown ran. As it's tossed to Tom Pierce, sears the defense and brings tears to the Green Bay supporters while Los Angeles nears the promised land. Tom Fears is a Hall of Fame receiver, but his career almost went down a different path. As a rookie, he came in, he was actually playing on defense, and in his first game had two interceptions, I believe, to return one for a touchdown, and at that point, his coach decided, well, that's too valuable of an asset to be putting in on the defensive side of the ball, and he said, this is a guy that clearly has the ability to be a ball hawk. Tom Fears, the young rookie from UCLA, who was to win the receiving championship in his first season. Fears set a record with 84 receptions in a season, and his mark of 18 catches in a game stood until Terrell Owens broke it 50 years later. Right side to Owens, and makes the catch, and is rating a new record every time he catches the ball now. To this day, the Rams hold the record for receiving yards in a game with 554, making them a core for the ages. He had two Hall of Famers in Hirsch and Fears, and then he had a guy, Bob Boyd, who had one year where he gained over 1,200 yards receiving, which is back in the 12-game season, that's, that's 100 yards a game. Fires to Bob Boyd, who makes a beautiful catch. In terms of the way they impacted the game, I think the Rams of the 50s will stand as one of the great passing teams that ever played. Up next, they receiving core so good, they needed a nickname. It's so not supposed to be yes, this it is. easy yes. for an offense to score like this. My gosh, it was an explosive offensive football team. Do you know how you will... With the Smurfs and the Fun Bunch, the Redskins may have cornered the market on great receiving core nicknames. The Smurfs, Smurf 1 and Smurf 2 back into the game. But they aren't the only group to get a great pigskin moniker. One could say the Broncos had a plethora of receivers, more commonly known as the Three Amigos. Touchdown to Mark Jackson. 
And who could forget the receivers of Houston's run and shoot offense? Over the middle, cut! And it's Drew Hill. Touchdown! But our next receiving core may have the greatest nickname of all. The number two receiving core of all time. The greatest show on turf. Unreal Torrey Hall. He's amazing. My gosh, it was an explosive offensive football team. They were just relentless. With that personnel, they would get you down and they would just flatten you. They got a straight up track meet going on in St. Louis. I mean, we could strike at any point in time in the game. We had so much fun. It was so much fun. Everybody scores in this offense! Over a three-year span, our number two receiving core had the league's number one offense, setting records for points and total yards. Put it down, man. Big game. You had Mike Martz, who just threw caution to the wind, and this is what we do, try and stop us. I love that mentality from the offensive side of the ball. When that group was together for those three years, that's a pretty incredible group. How about that offense? I think those receivers at that time with that offense and that running back, I think it was a perfect marriage that they all came together at once and you saw what could happen. It's not supposed to be yes, this it is. easy yes. for an offense to score like this. Pull your boots up. Score on three. One, two, three, score. It was amazing. I mean, he was a number one pick, so you thought he'd be good, but I didn't believe he'd have the impact that he had in his rookie year. The end zone. Holt followed up his breakout rookie year by leading the league in receiving yards in 2000. Torrey does it all. Torrey's a great deep receiver. You have to roll the coverage to him, otherwise he's going to kill you. Torrey's there. Touchdown, Rams! <laughs> The best on three. One, two, three. The best. I just got to look at this thing. Unbelievable. Well done by number 80. He's quietly had one of the best careers ever uh, in this league. The late Jack Snow always said he was the best route runner he'd ever seen. And the thing about Isaac Bruce was he would never drop the ball, but I can recall. And it is caught by Isaac Bruce. And they won't catch him today. Touchdown Rams. Do not be afraid. The Rams would not be our number two receiving core without Marshall Falk. The former MVP averaged 83 receptions, over 900 yards, and seven touchdowns over a three-season period. Marshall Falk could have played wide receiver if he wanted to because he was that good at just running pass routes. We would put him out there by himself, and they would leave a corner out there, and he would routinely beat that corner like a wide receiver. It was incredible. One, two, three, GSOE! Oz Akeem and Ricky Pro make the greatest show on turf, the deepest of all the receiving cores on our list. Tory would come out of the game, and Oz Akeem would come in, and he had the capabilities of catching a short one or a deep one and going all the way. And you take Isaac Bruce out of the game, and a Ricky Pro would come in, and this guy, yeah, you, you look at him like, is this slow white guy who's going to beat me? And he would beat you. Ricky Pro with a grab. So when you go look at those four receivers, and you see Marshall in the group as a receiver, it's, it's a pretty special group now. And the Rams are just going right up and down the football field. And we ain't going to stop. And neither will our countdown. Up next. If their offense was on the field, you didn't want to leave the room. If you would hold it, if you had to go to the bathroom. You don't have to hold it any longer for our number one receiving core of all time. Before we reveal the number one receiving core of all time, let's catch up with the rest of our list. Number 10, the Colts play under the big top. He got it! What a circus pack! Touchdown, Reggie Wayne! Number 9, the Vikings elevate to new heights. They can't jump with me, golly! Touchdown, Vikings! What a catch by Carter! Number 8, the Posse rounds up touchdowns. You had three perfectly complimentary receivers, so you were picking your poison. Number seven, the Marx Brothers make their mark in Miami. That's quite an arsenal that Marino had to work with. Run for a 
touchdown. Number six, the Raiders spark plenty of controversy. How could there be three better receivers than those three guys? Number five, hail to the Redskins of the 60s. It was an offense that seemed at times unstoppable. Number four, the Niners make opponents blush. It was an embarrassment of riches. And you just knew that somebody was going to be open. Number three, the Rams get radical. They brought in five wide receivers. That was revolutionary. Number two, the greatest show on turf. Forget the big red ass. Superman wears a two and eight on his chest. And now, the number one receiving core of all time, Air Coriel. Coriel just brought a complete passing game. He changed the whole outlook of San Diego football once he got there. If their offense was on the field, you didn't want to leave the room. If you would hold it, if you had to go to the bathroom, or you need, you were hungry, or you wouldn't want to blink. Throws it in the end zone for Chandler. He's got it. Touchdown, San Diego. That team gave the town exactly what they wanted. The lights were just on the full time with that offense. He's going for Jefferson. He was so good that when our coaches were teaching the younger players how to run routes, they would say, watch Charlie. That's how you run that route. Charlie Joyner is the all-time leading receiver in the history of the National Football League. An NFL Ironman, Joyner played for 18 seasons and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1996. Joining Charlie in the Hall of Fame is Kellen Winslow, who, it can be argued, is the best receiving tight end ever. Winslow was the X Factor. This guy reinvented the tight end position. He had the speed that most tight ends didn't. He had the hands most tight ends didn't. He could get in places that most tight ends couldn't. Everybody equates a passing team with a finesse soft team. Nobody called Kellen Winslow soft. At least they didn't call him soft twice. He would catch the ball, and then he had an attitude and that he was going to try to hurt somebody after it. Kellen Winslow, Hall of Fame. Charlie Joyner, Hall of Fame. Now you take John Jefferson, who in a brief window might have been the best of those guys. John Jefferson, just freakishly good. He's going for Jefferson. I remember J.J. Jefferson being one of these guys that had a tremendous hunger for the ball. If he was going to be around it, he was going to get it. When he came in the National Football League, people said, put his name on the first ballot, Hall of Fame. Kellen, a friend of mine told me that you felt like you were the best receiver Chargers ever had. I mean, I was the best receiver while we were there. Okay, so I left early. After a contentious contract dispute, Jefferson was traded to the Green Bay Packers and replaced with Wes Chandler. Give me Wes, please. Can I have Wes, please? Wes was almost a clone of myself. In fact, he was probably faster. Of course, he drafted how he could do a lot of other things I couldn't do. Jump ball! Wes Chandler, 1982, if there hadn't been a strike, would have had 2,000 yards receiving. He might well have 1,000 yards in this shortened season. That's phenomenal. That's hard to believe. John Jefferson and Wes Chandler, in my opinion, believe it, are better than some of the wide receivers that are in the Hall of Fame. Only an inferior defense kept our number one receiving core from winning a Super Bowl. A shortcoming that almost kept them out of our top spot. Throws it in the end zone for Chandler. But Air Coriel gets a pass for being innovative, prolific, and dominant. And yeah, having a cool nickname doesn't hurt either. So that's our list. And while it received a chilly reception from some, what's wrong with you guys? That is totally wrong. We hope it grabbed your attention. Carter oh, what a magical receiver that guy is. Greatest catch I've ever seen.